talking about developing spiritual insights. In everything that's happening in the natural, there's something that's happening in the heavenlies. And hopefully that we have eyes and ears, spiritually speaking, that we can hear and see what God is saying, what God is doing. A lot of times when people listen to the news and they see what's happening in our nation and around the world, we wonder, is God in control? It looks like the enemy is getting the upper hand because we see evilness on the increase. 20 years ago, I never heard of ISIS. And, and now it's something that's not just happening in the Middle East, but happening all over the world. And trying to figure out how can people bring about a better world through using a method of the sword to try to encourage people to follow their ideology. In my introduction, I'll make a few comments about things that are happening that are affecting you and me. Uh, we're living in a world that seems like it's being turned upside down and inside out. Currently, our nation, politically speaking, is in an upheaval. You see a polarization taking place. You see people on the left, people on the right, and each side thinks that they're correct and right, and that's the way our nation needs to go, our world needs to go. Washington is divided. It seems like when a president, um, say when Obama was the president, and now Trump tries to put forth legislation, there's an impasse. Even in the Republican Party, you would think there'd be some unity, but you see that there is disunity. Currently here, the president talking about initiating a new tax plan. And hopefully that he can get that passed, reduce taxation on the middle class, on corporate America. Corporations in America are taxed more heavily than other companies and other nations. And then you'll probably see tremendous resistance and it's questionable if that would get passed because people say, well, with this reduced taxation, it's going to increase the national deficit, which is at $20 trillion. I first preached on the national debt and made reference to it. And just thinking about what the book of Proverbs says, the person who borrows money is servant to the lender. We are an indebted nation. At the time, back early 2000, I think it was 2007, 2008, maybe a little bit before that, the national debt was around $3.8 trillion, And we thought that was bad. It's $20 trillion and increasing by several billion dollars each and every day. You just can't keep writing checks without putting money in the bank. If we acted like the federal government, we'd be thrown in jail. The Democrats identify themselves as the party of opposition. As some of the Congress people from California said they wouldn't even go to the White House if they were invited. A house divided, the Bible says, will not stand. Everything that the executive branch of our government is trying to do, there's continued resistance and there's opposition. I remember when Eisenhower was president. I didn't see that then. When JFK was president, I didn't see that happening then. Ronald Reagan, I mean, there has been opposition, but not like it is now. Even most recently, Ann Coulter wanted to speak at a college campus in Berkeley, California. And because she's a flamethrower and she confronts things, they didn't want to hear that and protested and threatened violence because they didn't want her to exercise her constitutional right of freedom of speech. There's an attack now 
and the very fabric of our Constitution of freedom of religion and freedom of speech. That didn't used to be. You would think that people would be open-minded and tolerant and let's hear opposing views. But there's something that's going on in the earth. And you juxtapose that with what's happening in the heavenlies. And here's the question I present. What is God doing in the midst of all this dissension and upheaval? That's the question I often ask. God, what is happening in the world today? What are you doing? Now, some people who are deists would say what God's done, he started everything, initiated it, and like, Men like Thomas Jefferson and Franklin and different ones in times gone by and even today say, well, I believe there's a God and he started everything, but what he's done, he's stepped back and he essentially has taken his hands off humanity and just let the punches take place, let things roll on. I don't believe that. I believe that God is inherently involved in the affairs of government and mankind. I see it when I study the history of Christianity, when I study the history of Israel. I see a God who is involved in the affairs of mankind. And the reason a lot of people inside the church and even outside the church, especially outside the church, cannot see it because the good possibility, well, I think they lack spiritual insight. You see oftentimes, even in the admonition to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. He's talking about spiritually in tune. That's why I continue to read the Bible through every year. That's why I continue to read both secular books, good biographies, uh, books about current events, and also good books on Christian theology and Christian history, continually educating my heart and mind, continually teaching myself and learning as I listen to the Spirit of God so I can be sharp, so I can hear what the Spirit of God is saying, so I can preach a sermon such as this to you this morning. Now, to help us develop spiritual insight, some principles that uh, we need to understand. If you're following along in my sermon, Roman numeral two, some principles we need to understand. Listen, kings and presidents and prime ministers and even despots such as Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Is that right? Kim Kim (laughs) Jong-un. They perceive things in terms of natural power. This guy in North Korea does not care about anyone other than himself. He will sacrifice innocent people in his nation to build up his ego and his continual rule as a despot. And so... He wants to rule with an iron fist. He wants the capability of having a nuclear warhead, which he has, put it on an ICBM so he can threaten. Not only we see it happening there, but in several other nations in the world. They look and make decisions based on power. You see that when you study the Bible. You see Nebuchadnezzar. You see Sennacherib. You see even kings of Israel and kings of Judah, Ahab and Jezebel, making decisions and ruling and governing people by the use of natural power. But here's another important thing. The kingdom of God operates by supernatural power. Amen? We, as the Church of Jesus Christ, are members of the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of God is where he rules and reigns. When Jesus came, he talked about the kingdom of God. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. They were looking for his disciples, and many of the religious-minded people were looking for a political empire, a military empire. That's what they thought in their understanding of what the kingdom of God was about. The kingdom of God has been and is and shall be. When you look in the book of Daniel, it talks about the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, all these great powers and how they influence and exercise their strength and power over humanity at that point in time. But then you see what happened. It says that all of a sudden there was a little cloud in the sky that just appeared. And it began to increase. And that little cloud was representation of the kingdom of God. And it came, disintegrated the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. God's kingdom is not of this world, but we see God's kingdom where he reigns and rules. His kingdom is present in your life. It's not meat and drink. It's the presence and the power of the righteousness, of the goodness of God who reigns and rules in your heart and life. Amen? When you see a person come to Christ, you see a manifestation of the kingdom of God increasing. When you see someone healed, when you see someone delivered, you see the kingdom of God is present. Amen? When you see yourself between the rock and the hard place in God's intervention, you see the kingdom of God. You see things happening that you cannot explain with a natural mind. We have to sometimes explain things. That is a miracle. How many people need a miracle? Raise your hand. You know what qualifies you for a miracle? You have a need. You have a need. Now, I get impatient sometimes with God. I want it right now. I want to see this community with every knee bowing and every tongue confessing Jesus is Lord. I want to see every church fill the capacity and there's a line outside waiting again. I want to see a parking lot problem. Amen? I want to see things happen. I want to see things growing and things moving forth. God will have his way. Can you say amen? Point C, God's word contains a kingdom emphasis that relates to every person. I was talking about a kingdom emphasis that relates to every person and said this this morning. I believe at some point in time, and I pray this for my children and my grandchildren, for my members here. God, I want them to have a Holy Ghost encounter. I want them to have a one-on-one -on -one encounter with you. That's kingdom. You can't buy that. You can't earn that in an institution or a Bible college or a seminary. It's something that God initiates where he comes down and he visits you. You have a burning bush experience. You have the Shekinah glory of God that falls on you, that shakes you at your root. It's something that he stamps and marks on you and does a work in your heart and life. And you know that you know that you belong to him, you're born to God, that he's paid a price for you, and he'll never, ever let you go. No one can pluck you out of God's hand. You have that encounter. You have that earnest. You have that down payment. Something happens in your life. He marks you. He comes he takes possession of you, you yield to him, that will cause you to have enough energy and to have enough power and have everything anointing to go and move forward no matter what happens in your life. It gives you the strength to contend with any disease, any problem, any heartache, because you know that this is not the end, that you will come to a place where you've lived your life and you're ready to graduate, to go on to glory, to a new dimension, to a new place, and you can say this, the best is yet to come. Now what I want to see is everyone have that encounter with God. 
that kingdom emphasis, that your relationship with God is more than just reading words in a book, but this book becomes alive. Something happens that you look forward to fellowshipping with the believers, that you can't wait to get up in the morning to hear the voice of God, to serve Him, and do something with your life that has eternal value. Amen? That you know you have a purpose in place. Now look, everybody here has goofed up. Everyone here has made bad judgment calls, wrong choices. You've sinned, you've fallen short of the glory of God. But you know what? I've got a Redeemer. You've got a Redeemer. Amen? He comes to save, to heal, to restore, to strengthen our life. He never, ever gives up on you. Never. He's not a quitter. He holds you in the palm of his hand. Nothing, it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, will separate you from the love of God. No devil, no principality, no power, no person, nothing. You can be thrown in jail. You can suffer and be persecuted, but they can't take what God has placed in your heart and life. But you must say yes to him. He doesn't come down and make us and force us. He comes to us. He wants us to say yes to him. But so many people go, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know about this religious stuff. It's not religion. Religion will send you to hell. I'm talking about relationship. I'm talking about knowing God. I'm talking about smelling God, tasting God, loving God, putting your arms around him and hugging him and saying, God, I thank you. You've not forgotten me. I'm chosen. You're chosen, amen? I talk to people who don't know God, and I say, what is it about you? I says, because God chose me. I pray to God that he chose you. If he doesn't choose you, you will never bend your knee. You might be a good person, do a lot of good things, make a lot of money, live in a nice house, but when it comes to God, there's a big, fat zero. It's not so much, do you know him? The question is, does God know you. Amen. My prayer is that you take the word of God and understand that there is a kingdom emphasis. God's reign and rule. The kingdom of God is where God reigns and rules. He, the kingdom of God is in my church. The kingdom of God is my home. Even when I go fishing, the kingdom of God is there. That's why I hooked that big bass yesterday. I do invite him to go fishing. I know that Jesus was a fisher of men. I know when I get to heaven, I will still fish. I'm taking my boat with me. If you believe that, I got some land in Florida that's three feet underwater I want to sell you. Point D. Now listen. Spiritual wisdom and revelation are not gained through intellectual pursuit. I went through three years in seminary getting my NDIV and a lot of good stuff and learned a lot of things. But spiritual wisdom, revelation, didn't come from sitting under good men of God. Nothing wrong with that. But it's only given and understood only by God and through God. Some things to understand about Developing spiritual insight, having eyes and ears, not perceiving things naturally, but perceiving things in the spiritual realm. All right, number three, I want to give you a biblical example, just one that just popped out of my head when I was preparing this sermon. There's several, but this is one I like. Where God supernaturally intervened in the affairs of mankind to accomplish his purposes. Now, you can find this story about King Hezekiah, who is one of the good kings of Judah, and a contemporary prophet at the time was Isaiah, and on the other side was the king of Assyria, known today as Iraq. His name was Sennacherib. I use a colloquial term, snatch a rib. 
Sennacherib, snatch a rib. This guy was one who was trying to snatch this and snatch that. Arrogant, looked at things politically and military based on natural strength and power. He decides to conquer Judah. Judah was the southern kingdom. Israel was the northern kingdom. He comes against them with this huge army. Numerically, they surpass the army of Israel. He comes up against them, as I mentioned here. As he comes into the land of Judah, he conquers 46 cities. He's conquered numerous other kingdoms. I mean, this guy is like the blitzkrieg of the German army in World War II. He's just taking his tanks and his stormtroopers, and he's just annihilating. They cannot stand in front of this guy. The last city he takes before he gets to Jerusalem is Lachish, which was one of the strongest, most fortified cities in Judah. Knocks it out. Not a problem. So Hezekiah, a smart man, a godly man, one of the good kings of Judah. What he does, he says, well, I'm going to cut off the water supply to this army, make it tough for him. I'm going to fortify all the fortresses. I'm going to build up the army. So he does everything he can in the armor of the flesh to resist. Snatch a rib. He does everything he can. And this is politically astute. This is a wise thing. We see this happening right now. Trump comes in, he's going to build up the military. He's going to rule from a position of power. Smart. He wants to get jobs, build the economy, because if you're a strong nation, you have to have a strong economy. If you have a weak economy, you don't have the resources, you don't have the fuel, you don't have the strength to fund and fuel a strong army. This is what we've done in times gone by, over and over and over, not just our nation, but you can look at the Roman Empire, who reigned and ruled most of the known world at that time. Not just for a few generations, I'm talking about hundreds of years. And so, the most important thing that Hezekiah did was to speak these following words. You can find it in Second Chronicles 32.8. He says, With Sennacherib is an arm of the flesh. And he finally came to this conclusion, and it records his prayer, and he's calling out to God because he says, the numbers are against us. The pollsters are saying, we don't have a chance. He says, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. That's one thing I need to learn and you need to learn. You've got some things in your life today that you've done everything you can possibly do in the arm of the flesh. That doesn't mean that's wrong. I mean, you've figured things out. You've done everything you can to contend with this problem, this illness, this situation, to no avail. We have to come to the place where we say, Lord, I've done everything I can possibly do I need you to fight my battles. Now, I can look back at my life as a father. If you see one of your children going the wrong way, you're going to do everything you can to stop them. You're going to do everything you can to get them to make good sound judgments, to get them to turn towards the Lord, to remove themselves from bad influence, from the wrong friends, and you do everything you possibly can, and yet it's not working. Here's what I've learned as I raised my children. Because in times past, I've called attorneys, judges, the sheriff, all sorts of things. Here's the best thing I ever did, and this is what Hezekiah did. He got down on his face before God. He God would you fight my battles? I need 
supernatural power. I need you to change the heart and mind of that child. I need you to change the heart and mind of that spouse. Instead of trying to take matters into your own hands, I've done this. It doesn't work. All I've done by doing that is just push them further away. Now, I believe in and one of my granddaughters had a bad tire. So I wanted her to buy a new tire. Told her and told her. Finally, you know what I did? I went and bought the tire and put it on there. But the most effective thing, I get on my face before God and call on the name of God Almighty to apprehend her heart, apprehend his heart, and bring him into the straight and narrow. Hezekiah did this. He called on the Lord God. He says, this Assyrian army is after me. They're going to just wipe us out. They started using psychological warfare on the people of Judah. Now, here's the answer. Isaiah chapter 37. I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm just going to read what Isaiah said in answer to the prayer of Hezekiah. And God will do the same for you because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The book of Hebrew talks about the immutability of God, meaning God does not change. You go, oh, my goodness, <laughs> I forgot. This is 2017, and, you know, I've got to change the way I deal with this government. I've got to change the way I deal with these nations of the earth. God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's what he said. Isaiah 37, begin in verse 33. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God concerning the king of Assyria, O Snacherib, Snatcherib, or Snacherib, he shall not come into this city of Jerusalem, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. This guy won't be able to do one itty-bitty thing. He can't do anything. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it with my own, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake, because God is a covenant-keeping God. And guess what? God makes a covenant with you. A binding agreement signed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? I'm in covenant with God. You're in covenant with God. And then here's what happens. Snatcherib thinks, I've got him. I wiped out 46 cities. They're surrounded. I've been to Israel. It's not a city that's well defended that should be on a higher hill. You get the Mount of Olives and you look down and there's a city. That wasn't well planned from a natural point of view. You see, God doesn't do things by natural law. The city surrounded. It says, Then an angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 soldiers. One angel is more powerful than a nuclear bomb. One angel is more powerful than a million-man army. And when they arose early in the morning, those who were left behind saw all the dead bodies. What is going on? So Snatcherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. He's there thinking, okay, I'll just have to pick up with this later because thus far I have been successful and no one can resist the power of my God. He's in his temple. He's in his holy place. And he's worshiping this heathen God. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach, his God, that his son, Adam Malek and Sharezer, his son, smote him with the sword. His own boys, 
who he thought he could trust, came up behind her dad and took out a sword and stuck it in him. And they ran to Armenia. And S. Sardon, his son, reigned in his stead. So this guy thought that he had the advantage. Hezekiah got down on his face, and the kingdom principle, God's kingdom, operates by supernatural power. You see, this is what happened. God removed this threat. The best thing that America can do concerning all the stuff that's happening in Washington, D.C., all that's happening in the Middle East with ISIS, all the things that's happening on the border, all the things that's happening in North Korea is for our president, his cabinet, our legislative branch, our executive branch is to get on their knees and begin to call out to God in the name of Jesus. All our enemy has to do is get a chemical, biological weapon, go to New York City, take the elevator all the way to the Empire State Building on a nice windy day, just throw that anthrax into the air. How do you protect the nation from a suicide bomber who straps a bunch of bombs on himself or herself and sneak through to a stadium where there's 80,000 people watching the ball game and then blow themselves up. We need supernatural intervention. I remember back during the election, a lot of evangelicals said, we need to vote for Donald Trump, which I did. I thought was the best choice at that time. But the answer to America is not a political answer. There's a sovereign God who's control no matter who's in the White House. Libertarian, Democrat, Republican, God's the one who's in control. Amen? Sometimes we look, what's happening in America right now, you see two things happening. You see evil on the increase, you see good on the increase. You see both of these things happening. It talks about that happening in the end times. Understanding God's ways. Now listen to this. Spiritual insights will give new options. We need God's ideas and perspectives, not our human ideas. God cancels the rules of the earth. A truth. Here's what it says in the book of Hebrews. God is removing all things that can be shaken things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. You know what cannot be shaken? The kingdom of God. Everything else, as we move forward to the end of time, at the consummation of the age, when Jesus returns, he's shaking things right now. And the only thing that's going to remain is that which is of the kingdom of God. Amen? Listen, I might lose my life, you might lose your life, but that's not the end. That's not the end. Amen? You see so clearly when Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, he says, when Christ returns, those who have preceded us in Christ will be with him and the angels, and those who are alive remain shall be caught up with the Lord. Amen? Here's another spiritual insight. People talk about, I need a sign. Look at all the signs. And they go to the Matthew chapter 24 and not realizing that that's already been fulfilled. Talk about wars and rumors of war and pestilence and famines. Those things have been going on since the beginning of time. You see that recorded in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Those things. Here's the sign of the first coming of, of Christ, one sign, the sign of Jonah. Well, what did Jonah say regarding the first coming, the incarnation, the coming of Jesus as a baby? Talks about Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. You look at Jesus when he died on the cross, three days and three nights. But you see the resurrection. You see Jonah being spewed out. You see that sign. Now, for the sign of the return 
of Christ's second coming. He doesn't come as a lamb. He comes as a lion. Amen? It says the sign of Noah. So you go back, you read in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, what was going on in the days when evil was so rampant in the world. You see that God is not in the numbers. Out of the millions that were alive, only eight souls were saved, and God asked Noah to prepare ark. So what's the sign? It says this. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days preceding the coming of Jesus Christ. They were eating and drinking and giving in marriage and playing their rock and roll music and having a big party. Here's the thing that was so true, true then and true now that there were millions of people who lacked spiritual insight. They didn't see what was happening spiritually in the earth at that point in time, and that is so true now. You grab someone off the street and say to them, what is God saying and doing in the earth today? They go, I don't think he's in charge. I don't think that's just a lot of hocus pocus. Blind. To see and have spiritual insight, first and foremost, you must be born of God. That you can have an ear to hear and eyes to see, spiritually speaking. Amen? Note this. During difficult and tumultuous times, we must learn to stand, and here's what must happen. We need a heart shift to move from fear to move to faith. You see, faith not fear is what moves heaven. Amen? There are a lot of people who are perceiving things moving from a position of fear. What does it tell us in the book of Timothy? For we not have received a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen? Is it possible to develop spiritual insight? I want you to turn to... I'm going to close this. Ephesians chapter 1. One of my favorite scriptures in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. Paul prays for the church of Ephesus. The church in the book of Revelation that did a lot of good things, but one thing God said I have against you, Ephesus, you have forsaken your first love. You need to come back to Jesus. Amen? He says this, My prayer is this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what I need. That's what you need. God, give me spiritual revelation and understanding. When I read your word, when I hear the news, when I see things happening, that I can see, God, that you're sovereign, that you reign and rule, that you are in control, that your kingdom is forever, that you reign and rule, not only in our nation, but in my home. Amen? When I go home, when I come to church, I'm going to see joy, peace, and righteousness. I want to see an indication of, of the Spirit of God. Now, if there's chaos, confusion, I just say, in the name of Jesus, we're not going to do that. We're not going to allow that to be. Be gone in Jesus' name. I want joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit in my life, in my home, in my church, and where I go. Amen? You can have that. Yield to God. And if there's something that needs to be corrected, Lord God, correct me. Correct it. Change it. Bring about your blessing. You think about all the things we contend with, we're going to eat, where we're going to live, what we're going to do. If God takes care of the lilies of the valley, the birds of the air, I got a robin that is on my windowsill looking at itself and just making a mess on that windowsill. Now, I could resolve that real quick with a 
pellet gun, but something restrains me. So yesterday I went to Walmart and bought two rubber snakes. Surely this will work. I put the snakes on the windowsill, and the bird removed the snake. Ah, I need supernatural power. So today I'm going out there, and I'm going to speak to that bird, say, be gone in the name of Jesus. Stop pooping on my windowsill. Get out of here. I can ask God to take care of those things. Amen? You too. When I was a little boy, that would have been a BB gun target, but I can't do that anymore. Amen. I'll let Diana do it. So, what does that have to do with my sermon? I don't know, but it got your attention. It brought you back into focus. Amen? God grant us spiritual insight. Let's not get caught up in the natural. You see, I don't think it really matters who's in the White House because God is the one who's going to have the final say-so. Now, I pray for our president. I pray for our legislative branch. I pray for the Supreme Court, that we can have peace, that we can have the presence of God. We have that responsibility. Ultimately, I know that God is in control and he's in charge. Can you say amen?